child with a dead in my sight. Lost without hope, something like a place to be. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was a rescue, my life Touch his scars. 
You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Courtney Hayden, and I'm the director of guest services here at Salt Church, and I'd like to wish you and your family a very happy Easter. We are so excited to gather this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is a special day here at Salt Church. We've set up a photo booth in the lobby, and we'd love for you to stop by and take pictures with your family today after service. If this is your first time visiting us, we are so happy to have you here. If you grab one of these bulletins on your way in, you'll notice a section on the bottom called our Connect Card. We'd love to take an opportunity to get to know you better, so please fill this out, tear it off, and you can take it to the new here tent on your way out. We're also proud to partner with two local coffee shops, Evan Flow and Verado, and Spencer's Place and Surprise, and we'd love to give you a gift card to visit one of these shops as our way of saying thank you for being here. Next, I'd like to direct your attention to the back of the bulletin, where there's a place to add prayer requests. Here at Salt Church, our staff and prayer team are intentional about praying over the needs of this church, and we'd love to come alongside of you in prayer. If you're going through something and would like prayer, please write it down, tear it off, and you can drop it in the offering box right at the back of the auditorium today on your way out. Last but not least, coming up on May 1st, we will be launching a four-week marriage series titled For Better or For Worse. We'll be exploring God's design for marriage, dating, intimacy, and also being single. This is something you absolutely will not want to miss. Thank you again for being here to celebrate Easter Sunday with us. Would you please stand as we continue in worship?
So I was going to announce it next week, but I got that on Wednesday. You realize that put us and the GoFundMe at $21,082. We as a church made them whole plus $82. And again, I didn't have like a thermometer on the stage, like this is how much we need to raise. I just said give, and that's what happened. That's God being faithful to his people, and that's God working through you all. One of our value statements is open-handedness, and you all are way more than open-handed. I just, as your pastor, want to say thank you. I get to meet with his wife this week and give her that check. That's like the best part of my job. So thank you so much, Salt Church. You guys are awesome. So a couple weeks ago, uh, my wife, her name is Kristen. Uh, her and I have been married. It'll be eight years in October. Uh, our kids are age six, five, five, and three. So we have four kids. Uh, we have not gone out of town, just her and I, since our honeymoon uh, eight years ago in October. Uh, so it's always kind of tricky to do that. And a couple weeks ago, we had booked a, a first time that we ever got to leave home together. Uh, my mom came over and then spent the night with the kids. And we booked a trip to Palm Springs, California. Um, yeah, Palm Springs. Uh, we had never been to Palm Springs. We were driving home in December from Disneyland, and we're like, don't celebrities go there? We should act like we're celebrities. We're not. Uh, so we booked a little boutique hotel that had 11 rooms. And we get there, and they upgraded us to their nicest room. And I was like, thank you. I can't afford that. So thank you for putting us in that room. And our plan was just do nothing. Uh, for the 48 hours or whatever that we were there, just do nothing. Uh, we were going to sleep in, which for us means like 6 a.m. Uh, we were going to eat as much food as we could possibly eat, and we were literally just going to sit by the pool. That was our plan. Now, we had never been to Palm Springs, and if you've been to Palm Springs recently, you're picking up what I'm saying right now. It wasn't a crowd at the pool that a pastor and his wife normally hang around, okay? <laughs> Not the typical people we run with. Uh, so what do I decide to do? I'm like, no electronics. I, I, I have my phone with me just in case somebody died or something. Um, I decide to break out a book, like not Kindle version of the book, like real book, like old school, right? And it's a huge title across the top. I'm reading a book called Hope in Times of Fear. Uh, so that title is like everybody, you can see it from like 100 yards away. It's like size 150 font right on the front cover of the book. And then the subtitle is The Resurrection and the Meaning of Easter. And then there's an image on the front of the book with three crosses, right? So I'm thinking, well, I'm sitting by the pool. I got nothing else to do. I should read a book. I have to preach an important sermon in a couple weeks. So we're at the pool. We're just hanging out. I'm trying to mind my own business. There's a lot to take in at this pool. I'll just put it that way. Uh, there's a couple that's sitting by the pool, probably in their like 50s, early 60s. Uh, the man has his toenails painted blue. Now, if you came in here and you paint your toenails and you're a dude, good for you. I don't, but if that's your thing, go for it. Uh, I'm not going to judge. But they get up from their chair and they start walking to their room. And walking to their room, they had to walk past me and Chris, and we were all romantic on the same chair together, okay? Uh, so they go to their room, they walk by us, and the man stops, like, right in front of where I'm sitting. And he looks at me, he puts a big smile on his face, and he goes, hope in times of fear, huh? And I just kind of looked at him like... Yeah, and he goes, man, don't we all need hope? Like, look around, man. This world is crazy as blank. <laughs> and I was like, this pool is crazy as. But yeah, I nodded my head in agreement. I thanked him. Thanks for being a sermon illustration. And then, no joke, I like whipped out my phone and I wrote all what I just said. I wrote my intro to my Easter sermon there at the pool. But it's true. Like, I didn't mean, I didn't need the dude with blue toenails to tell me that. Uh, we're living in crazy times. Every morning, I make four shots of espresso and I watch Fox 10 News. That's just what I do. Don't judge me. Um, I turn on the news and every morning, Everything is like the worst thing ever. Everything that's reported is this is the worst thing ever. We're right now, and it's the worst ever inflation. It's the worst ever gas prices. Uh, Daniil sent me a meme the other day. It was the top picture was a guy getting gas in 2021, and he had his mask over his nose and his mouth. And then the bottom picture was a guy getting gas in 2022. The mask was over his eyes, so he couldn't see. I mean, I drive a Tacoma. It's like $90 to fill it up. Um, Worst ever inflation, worst ever gas prices, the worst ever allergy season, welcome to Arizona. The worst ever drought in the desert, They're, we're running out of water. We have the worst ever baseball team that we root for here. 
nobody watches, but we have the worst ever hockey team as well. I don't know if you've seen that. And then second half of football season, we have the worst ever team in the NFL. So that's what you get. There's the worst ever hurricane season. I don't know if you all knew that. I'm going to Alabama this summer. You're going to have to find a new pastor. Uh, worst ever war right now in Ukraine for the last several decades. And we are walking through, hopefully at the end of it, the worst ever pandemic in a century in our country. So there's despair all around us, there's fear, there's a bleak view of the future, all that's going on, and it's been going on for a really long time now. So happy Easter. Welcome to Salt Church. As crazy as that sounds, as crazy and as true as it might be, I'm up here to tell you that because Christ was raised from the dead, and because the tomb is empty, we have nothing to fear. Because Christ is raised from the dead and the tomb is empty, we can look not just to the present, but we can also look to everything in the future with one word, and that's hope. So I'm not going to stand up here this morning and give you a bunch of evidences why the resurrection really happened. I'm a pastor. I'm just going to tell you, it did. If you want to argue with me about it, we could talk in the lobby, but there's pl plenty of evidence out there that that tomb was empty because a man raised himself from the dead and walked out of it. So that happened. We'll just establish that. What I'm going to stand up here this morning and try to convince you is that hope can only be found. True hope can only be found in that guy who resurrected from the grave, and that guy is Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn them to the Gospel of John. And if you're new to church, it's not 1 John, 2 John, or 3 John, so it's John. Just no number. Gospel of John, very beginning of your New Testament, uh, John chapter 20. Uh, we're going to start our text this morning in verse 11, but we're going to just pick up reading in verse 1 just to give some context of what's going on here. So uh, the book of John, chapter 20, starting in verse 1. It says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw the stone that had been taken away from the tomb. So it's early, on the first day of the week, that Sunday morning. It's early Sunday morning to where it's so early, it's still dark outside. So before the sun comes up, and we see Mary Magdalene, that's not Mary the mother of Jesus, this is Mary Magdalene, she gets up and she goes to the tomb early. And right away we can see the emotion that's being inferred in this text. Think about it. She's coming to the tomb basically in the middle of the night. If I were to leave my house while it's still dark out, I'm probably pulling out of my driveway right now at about 5.15 a.m. If I'm doing that, I either have a job that starts real early, or I just didn't get a lot of good night's sleep the night before, right? That's Mary. She gets to the tomb. It's pitch dark out. It's basically middle of the night. She sees the stone has been rolled away. That stone's been sealing the tomb shut for a couple days. Now when she comes in the middle of the night, the stone's rolled away. All of a sudden, the door of the tomb is empty. And right away, Mary leaves. It would have done her no good to walk inside that tomb because it's already dark outside. They didn't have lights. It would have been like a cave in there. She couldn't see anything. So what does Mary do? She leaves. And in verse 2, it says, So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. So Mary leaves the tomb. She runs to two of Jesus' disciples. You have Peter, Simon Peter, right? We all know him. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, who wrote this book, John. It's kind of a weird thing. Like if I were to write a letter to my mom, like, this is the child whom you love. And my sister, who did announcements, she'd probably slap me upside the head, but that's what John did. He's referring to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. And you'll see where his little, uh, his positive self-image comes in even better here in a minute. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So Jesus didn't just love John more than any other, but he apparently blessed John with some good foot speed, right? So here you got John running like a 4-3-40 to the tomb, and it says, and stooping to look in, so he's like, what's going on in there? He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he didn't go in. So he got there fast, but he got scared when he got there. He didn't want to go in the tomb. He gets to the front door of the tomb. He kind of peeks his head in the door. He saw the clothes, but no body. And he's like, nope, I ain't going in there, right? But there's old Simon Peter. 
right behind him, probably out of breath, like, John, you're fast, bro. He says, then Simon Peter came following him and went in the tomb. So we know Peter, right? He's the guy that jumps out of the boat to try to walk on water. He's bold. He walks into the tomb. He sees the linen cloth lying there. And then the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, which would have been typical burial practice. And they're lying, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. So Peter sees the, the thing that would have been on Jesus' head when they put him in the tomb. And then all kinds of linen cloths that would have been on Jesus' body, neatly folded. So all the ladies in here, I want you to know, Jesus wasn't a normal man. He was tidy, okay? <laughs> Notice he folded his clothes and he set them there before he walked out of the tomb. That's actually evidence that nobody came and stole the body because they would have stolen the grave clothes. They wouldn't have taken the grave clothes off the body, but I didn't tell you I was going to give you evidence. Um, so that's what happens. Verse 8, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John, it's <laughs> again, I was first. Also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So it's very clear you have John and Peter, two of Jesus' main disciples. They don't really know what's going on right now. They're just kind of looking in the tomb like, where did Jesus go? I would be asking a lot of questions because Jesus' clothes are there, but he's not. They didn't in that moment like step out of the tomb and let's put together like our theology of the Old Testament and see if all the prophecies are ringing true. They didn't know what's going on. All they knew is like what we would know. The tomb that they had visited that once had a stone over it and a man, a dead body inside of it, no longer had the stone in front of it and the man wasn't in there anymore, but yet his clothing was. So what does scripture tell us they do? Verse 10 it says, and the disciples went back to their homes. They're probably like, I have no idea what's going on here. They turn around, they go back to their homes. The book of Luke tells us that when Peter walked away from the tomb, he actually walked back home perplexed as to what happened. So again, they don't know fully what's going on. This, this wasn't normal. But there was one person that morning that stayed at the tomb, which is our text this morning. Verse 11, it says, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. So who was Mary Magdalene? Uh, this isn't Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her name suggests where she's from. So Mary is a woman, and she's from a city called Magdala, which is a city on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. If you're familiar with your scripture, you know Jesus does a ton of his ministry in and around the Sea of Galilee. We first meet Mary Magdalene in the book of Luke, where Luke tells us, that, tells us that there were some women who followed Jesus around during his ministry, providing for Jesus out of their resources. So we don't know what that means. That could have meant they followed Jesus around and just gave him money. Maybe they gave him a place to stay. Maybe they cooked food for Jesus. Whatever resources they had, they gave it to him. And Mary is unique because in, when Jesus first meets Mary, she's the woman who Luke says that Jesus met her and he cast seven demons from her. So this is a woman who when Jesus first met her, she's literally demon possessed when she meets Jesus. So Jesus heals her. He casts the demons out of her. She starts to follow him. And then she goes around with Jesus during his ministry. She goes around with him. She goes around with his 12 disciples and some other women. They all have a front row seat to everything Jesus would do. And she's with Jesus to the very end. We see her show up actively during Jesus' arrest, his beatings, and his crucifixion. So we know that she was present at the mock trial of Jesus. She heard Pilate pronounce Jesus' death sentence. She saw Jesus beaten and humiliated by the crowd, and she stood near Jesus during the cruci crucifixion and tried to comfort him. So what do we know about Mary? To say that she was close to the situation would have been an understatement. She was there through thick and thin with Jesus Christ, and here in John 20, it's her second time that morning at the tomb, and we don't know, it's, it's early morning still. Second time at the tomb. Remember verse 1, she got there before it was light out, and then she ran to tell Peter and the fleet-footed disciple, and she goes back with him. But they leave to go home. Those two guys leave to go home. Mary doesn't leave to go home. She stays right outside the front door of the tomb, overcome with emotion. And her thought process is, man, somebody must have stolen Jesus' body. That was a very common practice in that day. And she's like, where is it? Did they do further damage to her already bloodied and beaten body? There's concern in her heart over where the body of her Lord was. 
And she leans over to look inside the tomb, and verse 12 tells us that she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. So two angels dressed in white capture her attention. It wasn't the neatly folded clothes that captured her attention. It was these two guys sitting by the neatly folded clothes. And these two angels are like, yo, why are you still crying? Don't you know what's going on here, Mary? Can't you see that? And we read this story now and it's like, well, obviously, like you have an empty tomb. You got neatly folded clothes and you have two angels. It's very clear that an act of God happened that morning in that tomb. And the angels are trying to give Mary this message. But she's totally overlooking the work of God and just trying to figure out who stole the body. What's going on here? Verse 14 says, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. So another guy pops up behind her. It's Jesus in his resurrected body. But Mary's standing there and she's still missing the forest for the trees. <clears throat> Jesus asked the same exact thing that the angels did. Why are you weeping? And then he takes it one step further. He says, Who are you seeking? She's looking at the resurrected Jesus and thought he was the gardener. Think about that. If you're familiar with your Bible, you might remember one chapter earlier in John 19. It tells us that Jesus was put in a tomb, a brand new tomb that was in the midst of a garden. So she turns around and sees this man and probably thought he was cutting the hedges or whatever around the tomb. She looks at him and she says, look, sir, if you're the one who took his body, just tell me where it is. If he's not supposed to be in this tomb, just tell me. I'll go get his body. I have means. I've got resources. I could go move him to another tomb. I just want to make sure my Lord's body is taken care of. She cared deeply for Jesus and wanted to make sure he was taken care of. And then the, the story pivots in verse 16. It says, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. In John chapter 10, Jesus Christ calls himself the good shepherd. He says that the good shepherds, not the bad shepherds, the good shepherds, the sheep follow the good shepherd because they recognize the sheep's voice. A good shepherd talks enough to his sheep that his voice is recognizable to the sheep. The sheep stay close to the shepherd so that they can hear the shepherd's voice. For Mary, it was simply Jesus saying her name. And I thought about this. There's probably like 10 to 12 people on earth that if you blindfold me and they say my name, I know who's talking to me. And who are those people? My wife, my mom, my dad, my sister, people who are close to me. I know who that is. And for Mary, it was just simply saying her name. And you see in that moment that it takes closeness within a relationship to recognize somebody's voice. She didn't recognize Jesus' body, right? Maybe her tears were blinding her and she couldn't see. We don't know. But in a relieved voice, she now knows that, she hasn't, that the body hasn't been stolen. The body hasn't been misplaced. No, he's been resurrected from the grave and he's alive. And she turns around and cries out, teacher. Just in a sense of relief, right? And Jesus answers her in verse 17. It sa he says, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Jesus turns around to her and he says, I'm going to say something really confusing right now that any dude preaching this text on Easter can't explain. So this verse right here can be interpreted a million different ways. Okay, I don't have time to cover all that. But what I want to talk about this morning is understand the emotion that's going on here at the tomb. Filled with emotion. This is three days after Jesus had been crucified. Three days later, she's still uncontrollably weeping at the tomb to where she can't even see. Now, I've walked through a lot with people from this church this year. If any of you have ever lost someone suddenly or tragically, you can easily empathize with Mary right here. Just an immense sense of pain and loss. And when she recognizes it's who, the, who she hoped it would be, she clings to him almost like she doesn't want to let him go. 
We don't know, is she clinging to his leg? Did she give him a hug? We don't really know. She, we just know she clings to him, doesn't want to let him go. Almost like if she lets him go, he might disappear again. In that moment, Mary longs to be next to him. That's why Jesus is like, it's weird, don't cling to me, Mary. Why does he say that? He says, there's no reason to hang on to me. I'm not going anywhere. And then Jesus tells her exactly where he's going and where he is today as I stand up here. He says, go to my brothers, that's his disciples, go to them and tell them I'm ascending to my Father. I'm ascending to God. So why is the resurrection filled with hope? It's because the same Jesus who met Mary outside his own tomb is the same Jesus who today is not dead, he is alive. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father where he said he was going to go in verse 17. That's where he sits today and you know what he's doing? He is praying for each of you in this room right now by name. He prays on your behalf because he cares for you. Think about that. There's, we sing the song, How Deep the Father's Love. There's nothing deeper than that. So I could have gone in a bunch of different directions today. I just needed to redeem myself from last year. The air was off in here, and it was like the worst sermon I ever preached. Um, this year, I just want to talk about this text because John's giving such a powerful moment. He's giving us a snapshot of something like, how lucky are we to read this? What a beautiful picture of the gentleness, the care, and compassion of Jesus Christ. That's what we see here. Uh, I got a really cool opportunity this week on Thursday morning to come here and speak to the Fellowship of Christian Athletes group at Canyon View. So there's like 20 kids in the room, uh, and they said, can you talk about Easter? I said, sure. So I gave them the evidence, because high school kids need to be good at apologetics. But I said to the kids, I said, look, when you encounter the resurrected Christ... So that's who Jesus is. He's a resurrected Christ. When any of us in this room encounter the resurrected Christ, you have to make a decision on what to do with him. If there was a body that was dead and now it's alive and it's still alive, that's unlike anything that's ever walked this earth. You have to figure out when you know that, you have to figure out what you're going to do. And either it's going to do one of two things. Either you're going to allow Jesus to transform you or you just openly reject him in that moment for who he is. And that's the savior of the world. Look at Mary here. She's at the tomb regularly, it seems, right? She cares deeply for Jesus. When the stone's rolled away and he's gone, what does she do? She immediately crafts a narrative in her head of what might have happened. What do we see her asking herself? Well, where did they take him? She's so caught up in the narrative that she can't even recognize angels, and she can't even recognize that Jesus was standing right in front of her. And this is true of all of us, right? This is true of all of humanity. Like Mary, Jesus and the promises of salvation that he brings for a lot of us in this room needs to fit our expectations. It needs to fit our narrative. And when we encounter the resurrected living Jesus Christ, sometimes what happens is our expectations blind us from really seeing him because we don't really know what he does or who he is. Instead of allowing the resurrected Christ to transform us, we want to conform Him to us. We want to fit Him in our box. We want Him to fit what we want. And when He doesn't do that, what do we do? We get disappointed and walk away. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 3 that nobody seeks for God. Meaning that nobody in their natural state seeks the true God. Now we seek spirituality. You see all people all over the world, they seek spirituality, but they seek spirituality to a point where God is the one who has to fit our deepest desires. So that God becomes someone that either we can control, or God has to be someone who doesn't ever challenge what we think about life, our own narratives, the incorrect assumptions that we have about Him. We have to fit God in a box. But if you see this morning, why nobody knew what was going on with Jesus, it's because nobody was resurrecting from the grave in that day. If we see throughout the narrative of Scripture, the story of Scripture is that God never fits in your categories. How unloving and weak of a God would He be if He was everything we ever wanted? If He answered all the selfish prayers that you pray? How unloving and weak of a God would He be if He waited for us to move toward Him? What do we see Jesus do with Mary outside the tomb? She's looking all over the place, and she's looking in the wrong places, and He approaches her. 
There's some of you in this room right now that are looking all over the place. And you're looking at the wrong places and Jesus is approaching you. Jesus appears to Mary outside the tomb and what does he do? He asks her questions. Mary, why are you weeping? <coughs> Mary, who are you seeking? He doesn't reprimand her. He doesn't slap her on the wrist and say, didn't you know I was going to resurrect? I've been saying that all through the book of John. No, he meets Mary exactly where she is. I don't see any of you openly weeping. So I'll just ask you the second question. Who are you looking for? Who are you seeking? It's like Jesus is saying to her, Mary, you love me, but you don't understand me. And then Jesus cuts to her core. Notice the order he speaks to her. He calls her first by her name, and then she recognizes him. And that's how Jesus operates. Why? Because Jesus is the good shepherd. The sheep know his voice, and then they follow him. So here on Easter Sunday, I'll just ask you, what are you seeking? Maybe you're in here and you've been a Christian for a really long time. So was Mary. Yet she didn't recognize Jesus right away. She didn't have the whole thing figured out. There's some of you in this room that are Christians and you're walking through pain and brokenness right now and you're like, where is Jesus? And he's standing right next to you and you just can't see it because you're trying to fit him in a box of what you expect. But when Mary sees the resurrected Christ for who he really is, when she understands Jesus Christ for who he really is, what does she do? She clings to him. She does not want to let him go. If you came here this morning and you're a Christian and you feel distant from Christ, know he's the one who moves towards you, not the other way around. Ten times out of ten, Jesus Christ is going to walk towards you. And what's crazy is when you're caught up in sin, Jesus is the one who walks towards you and he is walking towards you with open arms. Even as a Christian, you don't need to be fully sanctified. You don't need to have it fully figured out. You just need to cling to him. And some of you need to hear that this morning. What does Jesus not do? He doesn't arrogantly correct Mary. He doesn't arrogantly ignore her cries for help. He doesn't arrogantly correct us when we go to him. He doesn't arrogantly ignore our cries for help. No, he pursued Mary and he comforted Mary. He pursues you and he comforts you in time of pain. Mary passionately seeks Jesus and Jesus in turn passionately comforts her. That's who he is. If you don't pick up on anything else I said this morning, hear this. Whether you're caught in sin, incorrectness, guilt, shame, whatever, fear, anxiety, addiction, Jesus is there in response to you right in this moment with an attitude of two things, love and gentleness, because that's who he is. Jesus brings hope because Jesus brings comfort. Like the man with the painted blue toe toenails told me at the pool, this world's a crazy place. The only thing that can bring comfort, true comfort, true hope, is Jesus Christ. Now to those of you in this room who are not Christians, I don't know what you walked in here with today. I know a lot of people come to church for the first time in a year, maybe you're here on Christmas, I don't know what your deal is, but I want you to understand, if you're not a Christian in this room, I want you to see who Mary was. This is a woman who, when she first met Jesus, she had to have seven demons cast out of her. Now, I know a lot of you walk in here like I'm the worst person ever and lightning's going to strike, but ain't none of you in this room, I need to cast seven demons out of you. And thank God, because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Before Mary met Jesus, she probably walked around the streets crying out half naked, tormented by seven demons. Think about that. She went from crying in the streets yelling out, possessed, to being called to a life of following Jesus. In a period of three years, she went from demon-possessed woman to a woman who was the first person to encounter the resurrected Jesus Christ. So don't come in here and tell me you're too jacked up. Jesus Christ can change literally anything. Perhaps Mary was so overcome with emotion and kept going to the tomb because she still couldn't believe that she went from being demon-possessed to being a child of God. And that's what happens so I don't know what you walked in here with this morning, but some of you need to know this morning that the same Jesus who took your name and nailed your name and your sins to the cross is the same Jesus who this morning is calling you by name like he did with Mary. And he's asking you, give up everything this morning and follow me. Become a child of God. 
It doesn't matter what you walked in here with. It doesn't matter what you're seeking. Jesus Christ is the only thing that can fill that hole in your heart. And guess what? When we turn to the resurrected Christ, he meets you with love. He meets you with tenderness. And he greets you by your name. He knows the count of every hair of head in this room. Hair on that head. And he doesn't have to count mine. I don't have much. But think about that. So I'm going to pray and we're going to sing one more song this morning. We're going to sing a song called Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Because it's true. That's why we're here. But listen, if that's you today, if you came here for the first time or maybe you've been coming here for a while, and you clearly see like, man, I understand. Like, I understand the sacrifice that Jesus made, but I understand what he does for me now as a resurrected Jesus. If that's you and the Holy Spirit of God is tugging on your heart this morning saying, follow me, don't let that. You, you can either openly reject that or walk toward it. And I'm going to tell you this morning, why not today? Uh, there's going to be some men and women over by the prayer sign as we sing this next song. Uh, if you want to come find me in the lobby, uh, I would love to talk with you and pray with you. Let today be a day of transformation in your life. But church, today's a day of celebration. Today's a day that we get to strut around a little bit. Why? Because Christ is risen. Christ is risen. The tomb is empty. And Jesus Christ is alive. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for who you are, Lord. Lord, I thank you that from the outset of creation, you ordained literally all this to happen, God. Guys, we gathered up here on Friday night and just in a somber manner saw the way that your son was brutally executed on a cross. And now we get to stand up here in celebration that when he walked out of that tomb on Easter morning, God, that he conquered sin, he conquered Satan, he conquered death by your power. So this morning, Father, it's that same power that rose Jesus from the grave is the same power that you give us to live. So God, I pray that you let us understand that the Holy Spirit lives in our heart, God, that you would stir up the Christian in this room to live with power. Lord, that you would stir up the people in here right now that are walking through brokenness to see like sometimes all we can do is just cling close to you. And that means spending time with you. That means maybe just sitting in silence with you. God, I pray for the people who walked in here who don't know you. God, I pray that they just open their ears and they hear your voice calling them out by name this morning. God, that today would be a day that they pass from death to life. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is just present in this room as we sing this next song, God. Let this just be a celebration as Christians. Like Heidi said, we look at our tomb and it's empty. Every other tomb is still full. And God, we get to celebrate that this morning, God, because you're a good God and you care deeply for your children. So Father, I pray that this morning and today is a celebration of who you are. It's in your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Stand and let's sing together. Thank you.